Thank you very much. I'll try to share my screen. Um. Okay, is it working? Yeah. Okay. okay. Good. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ines Katri. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organization for the kind of invitation uh, to be here and speak a bit about the situation of the Lesser Castro in, in Portugal. Uh, in this talk, I will try to resume the, 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 the research we've been doing in the last 20 years on the Lesser Castles, and I'll try to highlight uh, some points and uh, to explain what, why research and long-term monitoring is very important to establish and, and especially to adapt conservation efforts and also to give some examples on how the implement, implementation of conservation measures can present sometimes an, an expected challenge for the conservation of target species. Uh, like I said, we've been working with lesser kestrels from 2000. Uh, during this time, we've performed seven national surveys. We've uh, monitored more than 7,000 breeding events and drinked over 10,000 lesser kestrels and all our research results in more than 20 scientific papers published till now. Um, just a quick resume on the, on the situation of lesser casserole in Portugal. Like in many other European countries, the species seem to be, be very common in the past, then suffer uh, a, a deep decline. And in 2001, in the first more complete national survey, the species was uh, estimated at less than 300 par pairs. Uh, loss of nest sites, uh, seem to be the most important driver of, of these declines and often related with the, the restoration and collapse of, of all buildings that hold colonies. So artificial nest sites were suggested as a, a good way to revert the population of the lesser castro. And so in 2003, we start a live project aiming at recover the, the, the Portuguese population of lesser castles and the major goal was to try to recover the, the breeding habitat and the, the nesting conditions for, for the species. Uh, management actions took place in, in 27 um, old buildings, both colonies and, and non-colonies, uh, where we have provided more, more than 100 cavities and also other kinds of nests, such as wooden nest boxes or clay pots. And in places where there were no, no buildings, we have built eight breeding walls plus three breeding towers. This is an example of a breeding wall built during the, the, the life project. And in, in the total during this project, we, we provided more than 1,000 new nest sites for, for lesser castles. When the, when the project finished, one of our main goals was to assess the effectiveness of, of nest site provisioning. And what you can see in this plot is the, the, the success, the effectiveness of nest provisioning with increasing in the, in the, in the population of lesser castles. And this was due basically to the provisioning of artificial nest sites because the number of castles nesting in natural breeding sites remain more or less constant. In 2007, we had more than half of the entire population breeding in artificial nest sites. 10 years later, we decided to, to, to repeat the exercise, this time just in the, the SPA of Castro Verde that anyway holds more than 90% of the Portuguese population of lesser castles. And we can see that the population was still increasing, again, due to the provisioning of nest sites. And in 2017, we had already 68% of lesser castle pairs breeding in artificial nests. This could be uh, the end of uh, a happy story um, uh, showing the effective effectiveness of nest site provisioning. But although nest sites have been uh, used in many countries and is a popular measure to revert the population trends of, of endangered species, there are some studies that point that those could, could act as well as ecologic ecological traps for, for species. And how can they work as ecological traps? By attracting birds, if we are attracting birds to low quality habitats, by allowing super optimal breeding densities, if we are provided, providing 
unsuitableness sites or sites that increase the the, uh, the attractiveness of, of predators of predators also by introducing new predators or competitors and finally if if those nest sites uh, if species become very dependent on nest sites and then we can say that they are conservation reliant species Mertula village in in portugal was was the the largest lesser castro colony um, it was only it was also the, the only urban colony in Portugal. And uh, although the, the, we have uh, been providing nest sites in this colony, the population trend showed uh, a continued decline. And in 2021, we had only 16 breeding pairs remain in this, in this colony. So we, we want to investigate what was, going on, what was going on in this colony. And to, that, to do that, we compared Myrtle Colony with two other colonies in the Castro Verde SPA, where we had provided nest sites as well, and where the population uh, showed uh, positive trends. So we've, we decided to track birds in all three colonies. And what we found out is that in, in the colonies where the population were increasing, usually birds would travel on average uh, up to two kilometers to, to feed. So showing small home ranch sizes, while in Mertla, birds have to travel uh, much further and going up to six kilometers and having huge home ranges. So we, we, we wanted to investigate what was going on in terms of habitat on the colonies in a three kilometer buffer around the colonies. What happened is that the, the two first colonies had uh, a high proportion of suitable habitat, while in Mertla, the proportion of suitable habitat was only 7% and was declining uh, over the last decades. So that could explain why the fledging success was significantly lower in Mertula colony. And we also measured the body condition of chicks at fledging, and it was significantly lower as well. And so we could indeed be attracting birds to a poor habitat quality, and this could result in an ecological trap. Regarding the, the, the provision of unsuitable nest sites, uh, one of the first alerts on this potential trap took place in 2009 when we detect some mortality during a short period of unusual high temperatures. So we decided again to investigate the impact of high temperatures on lesser kestrel chicks. So we weigh the chicks every other day from hatching to fledging. In different, nests, in different nest types. And what you can see in this plot is that an increase in daily maximum temperatures increase the probability of chicks losing weight. And uh, around 37 degrees Celsius, you see that chicks start losing weight. We also compare different nest sites and uh, find out that chick growth was significantly lower in other nest boxes. In hot days, Nestlings face a conflict between evaporating water to maintain body temperature and the need to conserve water to avoid dehydration. So if body temperatures exceed a, a lethal limit, they die for hyperthermia. If they lose too much water, they can die for, for, from dehydration. From one of the other, we estimate that 36% of chicks died during two different years with high temperatures and the ones that survived lost up to 30 grams, which represents 27% of the body size of chicks. This value does not account for indirect mortality when chicks jump from the nests to avoid high temperatures and they end up dying from dehydration, starvation, or predation. So we have also compared temperatures inside the different nest sites that we've provided. And in this plot, you can see that indeed in nest, in the wooden nest boxes, and especially when, when exposed to the sun, uh, the internal temperatures in the nest can be very, very high, explaining the, the mortality rates that we observed in these very hot days. Um, so uh, another potential trap uh, when providing nest sites could be the introduction of new predators and competitors. And this is a common example of a breeding walls we <coughs> Where, where the breeding walls can be found. And in this tree less landscape where lesser kestrels uh, breed with few places to nest, a breeding wall is indeed uh, an oasis. It's an oasis for many species. And, and, uh, and all, all new breeding walls were, were very rapidly colonized by, by, by several species. 
Usually we can find in these breeding walls 20 to 40 uh, breeding pairs of lesser castors, but then there are several pigeon pairs also occupying these breeding walls. We can have jackals to uh, up to 15, 15 pairs of jackals. Usually these breeding walls have uh, barn owls, little owls, and common castors, one, one of each usually, and then rollers, two to three couples in, in, in each, in each breeding, breeding wall. During our visits to these colonies, we have detected several, several and not expected interactions between lesser castors and other species. And with the help of cameras and, and by, by di direct observation, we have recorded predation among uh, amongst many, many, many species and some interesting results like this starling, this adult starling uh, predating on a lesser castrol hag that uh, was very surprising for us. But we also found out a situation that we've called interference competition and is when a clutch of a species is replaced by, by other species clutches. So one species can remove the eggs of another species to lay their, their, their own their own eggs. And so we've tried to connect species and inter inter interactions. And in our uh, studied bird assemblage, predation occurred between all species except pigeons. So we had barn owls predating on adult lesser castles. We had jackals predating on lesser castle eggs, little owls predation, predating on, on starling eggs and nestings, starlings in their way predating on, on rollers. We found mutual predation between starlings and lesser castles, and then rollers removing eggs of little owls, lesser castles, and starlings with a, a symmetrical interference competition between starlings and rollers. What is the effect uh, of these mixed species colonies for lesser castles and all these interactions in a, a study during four years and four different breeding walls? Uh, we found out that 22% that of lesser ca uh, castral pairs lost eggs or nestlings uh, driven by these interactions between, between species. Uh, besides competition for nests, these mixed species colonies likely promote competition for food resources during the breeding season, which is a season of high demand for food. So in this case, we use stable isotope analysis of nitrogen and carbon to assess the dietary segregation between species. And what we found out, and you can see in these plots, uh, there's a, a, a high isotopic overlap among species. You can see, especially amongst common castors, little uh, lesser castors, rollers, and starlings. Uh, and this suggests that indeed species might compete for, for food resources. And finally, how can nest, nest site provision make conservation reliant species? These are two examples of lesser castle colonies monitored during almost 20 years. And in both cases, the decline in the number of breeding pairs is the result of the degradation and collapse of buildings with the collapse of roofs and walls. And then the, the, they, they lead to the, the loss of the breeding sites. I don't have time to explain here, so you need, you'll need to, to believe me, uh, but we've done some modeling and we have concluded that in average, one building remains suitable for less orchestras only during 30 years and all buildings, the existing buildings are expected to disappear until the end of this century. These will make lesser orchestras fully dependent on, on artificial net sites, but also on continued management actions and funding. And because life projects usually are ephemeral and other conservation projects are ephemeral, uh, they do not maintain or, re or replace the nests that, that are needed to be replaced or maintained in the long term. <clears throat> so can we afford to conserve lesser castles? And to answer that, we need to, to, we need to know how much funding is needed and look for long-term funding solutions. And again, what we've done, we're, we've done some calculations and conclude that sustaining the lesser castle numbers in Portugal uh, will cost around 4,500 euros per year. Um, and then we looked at the potential of using tourism income to fund, to fund lesser castle conservation in Castro Verde. 
as nature-based tourism is increasing uh, quite a lot in the area. And we found out that the annual value is uh, around 4,000 4, euros that is needed represent less than 1% of the region lodging income. Suggesting that this is a, indeed could be a good opportunity to fund long-term viability of less orchestrals in Portugal. So just to resume my, my talk, uh, nest site provisioning in Portugal has been highly effective in increasing the less orchestral numbers, but climate adaptation strategies should be considered when, when, we're, when we implement conservation projects. Conservation actions, as, as, as I've shown, can reshape communities and alter species dynamics, dynamics uh, like creating these mixed species colonies, and need to consider, so, so they need to consider the ecological uh, niches of target and sympatric species, uh, as well as their, their interactions. Less cases in Portugal and probably in many other countries will become total, fully dependent on, on continuing management actions and funding. So it's, it's, it's really uh, crucial to find where to fund the long-term uh, conservation of lesser kestrels. And in the case of Castro Verde and the Portuguese population, it seems there is a great potential in using tourism for do that. And so finally, just to conclude, I hope to have shown how important is long-term monitoring to find solutions to conserve the lesser kestrel in the long term. I just want to thank all the people that have worked with me all these years, uh, because this is not the work. Uh, it's not only my work and many people that have been taking involved. measures to avoid Jack. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you same. very much, Ines. <laughs> Uh, Marta uh, Juncal. Yes. Do we uh, have any questions for Ines? Yes, we have one uh, in English. Hello, Diego. Vale. Have you taken measures to avoid jackdaws? Because in Catalonia, it's the main competitor for all species in artificial towers. We 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 have, but measures were not very effective. Uh, we've tried to reduce the entrances of the nests. But uh, we were surprised that in some quite small nests uh, that, that we thought they, they would uh -huh. enter, they ended up entering the nests or even removing the, 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 the kind of doors we have made for, for, for them not to enter. So um, they are indeed increasing and occupying the, the lesser castro nests. Uh, we, we don't know the, these observations we have made are, are, are not systematic and so indeed we don't know the, the really uh, the really impact of jackdaws on, on, on the lesser castles and there are other species that are that are um, that we saw didn't represent any threat for lesser castles as the starlings for example and they look uh, much more uh, a much, a much more dangerous species for lesser kestrels than the jackdaws, for example. And for these ones, we don't really know how to how to implement measures to 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 avoid them to to use the lesser kestrel nests. Any more questions? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, um, have you checked the uh, for mammals attacks on these next boxes? There are there are some mammals as well uh, predating on 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 lesser kestrels, but uh, but avian predation and uh, it's 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 more common. Although there are some some rats, for example, going to the to the kestrel nests and predating, and then when when chicks fledged. There are some other predators, but we we think that uh, uh, avian predation and this interference competition has a uh, highest impact on on the on the castles right now. Hay más preguntas. Okay, thank you very much, Inés. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.